Hmm. Well, good morning. Let's see. Riley, did your electronics kit arrive yet? Yeah, I, I got it yesterday. Okay, good. I insured those things just to be on the <laughs> side. And also, I was curious if you had the opportunity to post any like videos of this week. Oh, I guess some of the videos didn't get. Oh, I may have forgotten to put up yesterday's. And then forming this sheet too. Oh, it's up there. Yeah, I just need to stick it in the in the thing. I did upload it, but it's not available yet. Let me check and see if I um, uploaded yesterday's thing to YouTube. Uh, let's see. My channel. Manage videos. Electric flux and into it. Let's see, that was yesterday's. Yeah, I put it up there. Let's see if I stuck it in the. Oh, nope. I haven't posted the video yet, but it's on YouTube, so it'll just take me a couple minutes to do it when it's time or when we're done here. Um, I just posted a new assignment, kind of lab and assignment. It's something I usually do in a lab period. And it's on uh, Gauss's law coming at it from a whole bunch of different directions. And uh, it's due in a week, I think next Thursday at midnight or something like that, 11.59 PM. Um, I would very much encourage you to get together on your your Zoom site and talk things over if you can make arrangements to do that, because bouncing ideas off each other will help a lot. And uh, that's all I can think about that right now. Uh, we're going to continue with some applications of Gauss's law today, but something I want to talk about is a, a few kind of basic ideas here. Whoops, I haven't turned on the IPVO thing yet. So that's not going to work. Okay, that's focused. I can share to that thing. Okay, and some of these are um, sort of basic ideas, I guess, but um, we'll just go with them and see where we get here. Uh, one is that, and these are in electrostatic situations, so uh, as soon as you apply something to a conductor where it's continuously producing an electric field within that conductor, these rules don't apply. But these rules apply where you have some sort of an electrical conductor and uh, some charge gets put on it somehow. You could take a, a glass rod and I can't remember if you rub the glass rod with silk or fur, but anyway, uh, you can get static charge built up on it, and then you can wipe it onto a conductor, so that could happen. Um, and within a very short time, the charges within the conductor will rearrange themselves. You're not actually going to get that much charge on a conductor from a glass rod, but they'll rearrange themselves. And this is something that ha takes place in like uh, less than 10 to the minus 10th seconds so a tenth of a nanosecond, and the charges in the conductor will rearrange themselves and the electric field, yeah, I'm gonna bring it down here so I can reach it better. I'm happy to report that uh, 
my computer that I use for this has not crashed since the night before last. So um, I used it all day yesterday for quite a few different things. Anyway, the electric field within a conductor is zero. And this is in an electrostatic situation. Okay, so you apply charge to the conductor within a tenth of a nanosecond, or it may be far less than that, but uh, the electric field is going to be zero within the conductor. And a second thing, on the surface of a conductor, Actually, I could have worded this better. <clears throat> um, the electric field is perpendicular to the surface at every point. Um, so you may have to zoom in a lot on a a sharply curved surface or something that appears to be a point. But if you zoom in enough, you can always draw a line tangent to the surface and then the electric field will be perpendicular to that tangent. Um, let's see, and a third thing that happens is uh, any net charge on a conductor resides on its surface. Now this can um, get bent a little bit if you happen to have a conductor with a cavity that is a, a hole in the middle of it or a, a bubble in the middle of it or something like that, there can be charge on the surface of the cavity. We'll do an example problem with that. But uh, <clears throat> if you have a solid metal conductor, all of the charge is going to be on the surface of that solid metal conductor. And so uh, these are some things that apply anyway. All right. Well, uh, yesterday I mentioned that we would apply Gauss's law to uh, some of the other situations of symmetry that you have. And yesterday we looked at, um, let's see, when we had an infinite line of charge that produced a sort of, uh, that's one of the types of symmetry where you can actually apply Gauss's law to it. And so you might practice that a few times just for uh, determining the electric field outside of a an infinite line of charge. Um, it's not that far off if you have a non-infinite conductor. Uh, one example of that is a, uh, a Geiger counter. And a Geiger counter has a cylindrical area. I'm exaggerating the length of it and running down the cylindrical area of it is a, a wire that's in the center of it and that wire will be charged to a um, well a positive positive charge is deposited onto that central wire and it's actually part of a circuit where um, somehow this end of it would be hooked back to some sort of a power supply. But you use Gauss's law to estimate the electric field 
of this thing, even though it's of a finite length, like typical length in a Geiger counter is maybe the distance between my fingers here. So it's not a huge amount. Uh, other types of detectors like that you would use Gauss's law on. My first summer in graduate school, I worked um, for a cosmic ray research group. Cosmic rays are uh, uh, charged particles that come in from space and I uh, can't remember exactly much what they did. I only worked for them for about uh, two and a half months or three months and uh, at the end of that I decided that I would rather not um, continue research with that group. It could have been interesting but the two faculty members in the group were always at odds with each other and it was just kind of uncomfortable most of the time. So I went to someplace more peaceful. But anyway, um, they had me help or uh, work on the design of something called a multi-wire proportional counter. And it's a thing that had uh, tubes that had a central conductor running down them and the tubes would have been filled with something like argon gas because it's cheap and uh, it also doesn't react chemically with anything and they'd have a whole bunch of these rods next to each other, or these tubes next to each other. They might have a couple dozen of them laid right next to each other and if a cosmic ray happened to pass through there it would ionize atoms along its path and they could tell which of the tubes it penetrated and then beneath this they'd have a set of tubes that were at right angles to all of these and by doing that um, they could get some information about the direction that the cosmic rays happened to come from and I think they may have had the the lower ones separated by some distance from the upper ones but they had me writing a a computer program to do a bunch of calculations for this thing and <laughs> the hard part was that this was in the summer of 1984 I think and uh, they decided that uh, C was going to be the computer program of the future and so they had me write the computer program in C that did all these calculations. Well C was the computer program or the computer language of the future. Otherwise, it would have been done in a language called Fortran, um, which most of the research groups were using. But I had a really hard time finding a book on using C for scientific calculations. In fact, I don't think I did. Um, what I ended up doing, I just, there was a book on the C language that's super basic and everybody starts off with or something like it. But I was able to read that and start getting the hang of the programming language, but it had no mathematics, complex mathematics built into it. And I was having to use things like sines and cosines and logarithms and, and things like that. And for every one of those things that I used, I had to write a subroutine that would calculate the um, sine or cosine or logarithm or whatever using the first few terms of an infinite series. And by the time you get to the fourth or fifth term, you've got more significant figures than you need. So it wasn't too horrible, but I had, I learned, learned a lot about writing subroutines that summer. And that was just kind of a weird thing. But I was using, I used Gauss's law to figure out the electric fields in each one of these tubes. And actually, once you do it, it's the calculation that we did yesterday. So it was sort of a neat application of that. Um, anyway, here's some things about these. Yesterday, we looked at one of the situations of symmetry, and that is that uh, you can figure out the electric field a distance away from a very long wire, long straight wire. Another sort, so here's the types of symmetry that we can apply this to, to actually calculate the electric field. Um, uh, 
Okay, so one is cylindrical. And um, the word cylinder, <laughs> we're going to talk about round cylinders. Uh, cylinder, the definition can be a little broader. It can apply to anything that has parallel sides, but we'll stick to something that's circular cylindrical symmetry or something like that. The other one that can be applied, or one of the other ones, is spherical, except we're not actually going to do that, um, although we could. Actually, I did kind of do a, a calculation with that yesterday, and I showed that the, well, I showed that with spherical symmetry around a point charge, um, the net flux through the sphere was the charge inside divided by epsilon naught. Um, you could pretend you didn't know what the electric field looked like, but we don't, we're not going to worry about it. We're just going to say that the electric field for a spherical charge distribution, spherically symmetric, is KQ over R squared along R hat. And R hat at any point in space is something that points from the center of the sphere to the point in question. So it's radially outward and stuff like that. The third type of symmetry is planar symmetry. I think it's planar. I'm not sure how you spell that. But anyway, it's where you have an infinite conducting plane or something that looks infinite if you get close to it. And uh, I'll apply Gauss's law to that particular case, and, uh, and then we'll have that formula. And we'll have two different considerations in that particular situation. So instead of drawing an infinite plane, I'm just going to draw a rectangular sheet and just pretend that it goes on forever. Let's see. Um, we talked about charge distrib distributions when we had a linear charge distribution, and lambda is something that we used for charge per unit length. If we talk about um, a surface charge density, I think we'll usually use rho, although I'm not positive about that. Um, actually, let me check one of the problems we're doing here. Oh, nope, we use sigma for surface charge density. So uh, this is a lowercase Greek sigma. Uh, the uppercase Greek sigma looks like that, sort of. Anyway, so we're not using that. This is charge per unit area. And for volume charge density, I forget what we use. Um, one of those Greek letters, anyway, maybe it's rho. It could be. I'm not too worried about it for this. So we'll imagine that we have an infinite sheet with a uniform charge distribution on it. That'll give us the planar symmetry that we need. And its surface charge density is going to be sigma a lowercase sigma. I better label that. And we make up a Gaussian cylinder that will let us do this. Here's what we're going to use. We're going to use the integral over a closed surface of e dot n hat dA, or e dot dA, however you want to think of it as a vector. And we're going to pretend that we don't know the electric field, and we'll figure it out. And that will equal the charge enclosed by the, the Gaussian surface divided by epsilon naught. Now, for this particular problem, we'll imagine that this sheet has some thickness to it. And that's not going to matter how thick it happens to be. This sheet could be a, um, a metal surface, so it could be a conductor, or it could be something like a sheet of paper. 
And in fact, one of the example problems will do will be a piece of paper. So it can either be conducting or non-conducting. And we'll start with the non-conducting situation. Whoops, non-ducting, non-conducting. There we go. And it'll have a surface charge density, but that's where the charge is going to reside. So somehow somebody managed to plaster a uniform surface charge density on top of this non-conducting sheet. Okay, well, for our Gaussian surface, we're going to draw something that looks like just a little hollow cylinder here, and we'll have it extend a ways down into the, uh, the sheet, whatever it happens to be, the non-conducting sheet. And we're gonna use, figure out this integral using some symmetry arguments here. Well, I'm gonna take that integral over the surface and split it into three parts. Uh, the three parts I'll consider will be the top surface of the um, cylinder, the Gaussian surface that I drew here, the curved sides of the Gaussian surface, and then the bottom of it. And so I'll have an integral of e dot n hat dA over the top plus an integral of e dot n hat dA over the curved sides plus the integral of e dot n hat dA over the bottom. Okay, and so um, that's how it'll work. And I can put the bottom just barely beneath the surface if I want to. And so we can go with something like that. Okay, well, with the symmetry we have, at any point you pick, you'll have this uniform sheet of charge spreading infinitely in every direction. Because of that symmetry, there should be no side. Um, Mr. Ham, don't know if you can hear us. Uh, I guess not. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah the IPO froze up. But well, we can't hear you right now. Uh, looks like you're muted. Well, that's weird. That was just spontaneous. <laughs> okay. Was it just the sound that died? Um, it looked like you were kicked out of the meeting and then um, it froze first and the video and the sound cut out and then it kicked the IPvo out and then you came back and I okay. that's about it. I'll try going back to that. Can you see the sheet again? Um, how much of that did you miss, or how long did it last? Um, we had just gotten to the part with the um, bottom part of the integral. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, had I Hopefully not much. The, the middle part of the integral, the curved sides being zero, or not? Uh, no, we hadn't gotten to that yet. Okay. Well, anyway, I... I split the integral into um, 
three parts, one for the top, one for the curved sides, and one for the bottom. And the one on the curved sides from symmetry, oh, I'm frozen again, looks like. Did it, did it cut out again, sound-wise? Oh, you're, you're okay. Okay. Um, looked to me like it froze up there. I don't know what might be causing that. But anyway, uh, with an infinite sheet, you'd expect the electric field to be just upward because any sideways components are going to be produced by an unevenness in charge on one side as opposed to the other. But this is a uniform charge distribution that spreads in it infinitely. So the electric field just should be straight up for a positive charge distribution or straight down for a negative one. But at any rate, the n hats on the side of the surface, Gaussian surface that we have here, would be perpendicular to the electric field everywhere, and that'll make this part zero. And so we would have that. Um, on the top, the n hat will point in the same direction as the electric field does. There's n hat. And so this just turns into E, the magnitude of E times dA. And uh, let's see, our integral becomes something that looks like the integral over the top of just plain E dA. But you'd expect the electric field to have the same value everywhere on the top of this little thing because it's all the same distance away. So that pops outside the integral. And let's see, that's over the top. You'll have the same thing over the bottom. And if you've got a nice symmetry here, you'd expect the, uh, the electric field on the bottom to be exactly the same as what it is up above. And so you'll have an integral over the bottom of E D A. And what you'll get is just E A here. E times the integral of D A plus E times the integral of D A. And the top and the bottom should have the same area. In fact, I'm going to stick a letter A on it if you made it a nice cylinder. So you get 2E A here for the, the integral part of this. Well, that's going to equal the charge that's enclosed by the surface divided by epsilon naught. Well, the charge that's enclosed by it is going to be sigma A. So Q enclosed equals sigma A. Sigma is charge per unit area. If you multiply that by an area, you get the charge on that area. And it's actually the charge is down here where it, our cylinder um, intersects the surface. So I end up with, for this, 2EA is equal to sigma A over epsilon naught. And E ends up equaling, well, the A's go away, and it's sigma over 2 epsilon naught. So the electric field above an infinite non-conducting sheet is just sigma over 2 epsilon naught. Now, what if you had a conducting sheet? If it was a conducting sheet, this bottom part would be within the conductor. The electric field within the conductor is zero. And so you just end up with, this is non-conducting. For a conducting sheet, you would end up with, uh, let's see, this term zero, so you only have EA equals sigma A over epsilon naught you end up with E equals 
sigma over epsilon naught. You just don't have the factor of two. And so there's the planar symmetry. And that's as complicated as it gets for something like that. And so now, pardon, oh, slide it up. Oh, I, what I have to do is re-aim my camera. How's that? A little better. I can see the bottom of the figure the way. Yeah. Um, but that's the for an infinite sheet. If it's a non conducting sheet like a piece of paper or uh, plastic or something like that, you'd have sigma over two epsilon naught. And if it's a conducting sheet, it's sigma over epsilon naught. So those aren't too bad. Okay. Um, Let's take on some uh, some problems that have to do with this. In fact, our very first problem, what's the approximate field strength one centimeter above an ordinary sheet of paper carrying a uniform charge density of 45 nanocoulombs per square meter, which isn't much. Okay, oh, something to notice about this there is no dependence on distance, okay? If you have an infinite sheet of charge, <clears throat> the electric field is the same everywhere above it. Now, there's really no such thing as an infinite sheet of charge, but if you're close enough to it, so it looks infinite, that's like uh, standing in the middle of a wheat field a flat wheat field in central Washington, if you start looking out in every direction, it'll look like it goes infinitely in every direction. And you might think you're on a, an infinite sheet. So that would be the idea. Um, it could act like that in that case. So we've got this uh, ordinary sheet of paper and we're only one centimeter above it. That's sort of infinite in that case and we'll just happen to see what it is. Well, if it's paper is non-conducting, so the one that matters here is the E equals sigma over two epsilon naught, and the one centimeter above it is immaterial. So we just take the 45 nanocoulombs, which is times 10 to the minus ninth coulombs per meter squared, and divide by two times 8.85 .8 times 10 to the minus 12th, and I forgot the units again. Um, I'm being lazy. I can figure them out, but uh, Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. Okay. What we'll end up with is, let's see, the meter squared go away. I'll end up with Newtons per Coulomb. Good. That's what an electric field should be. So just some weird little number here. Yeah, when I get, actually because of the tiny size of this, I get a fairly strong electric field. Um, 2.5 times 10 to the third Newtons per Coulomb is what it ends up as. Well, that wasn't too bad. That's a fairly straightforward Okay, um, here's one. What is the electric field strength just outside the surface of a conducting sphere carrying surface charge density 1.4 microcoulombs per square meter? All right, we've got a bunch of different ways that we can do this one, but one is just to calculate the charge on the sphere and the charge on the sphere will equal uh, there's its surface charge density, so that's sigma 
it'll just equal sigma times the surface area of the sphere, but the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. And we're not given the radius of this sphere. However, turns out it won't matter a whole bunch um, because the electric field of a spherical charge distribution is actually I'll write it 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. There's k and then the charge on the sphere and then divide by the radius of the sphere. And so I should have used a capital R. We usually use that for radius. But since the charge on the sphere is sigma times 4 pi r squared, it'll just be sigma times 4 pi r squared over 4 pi epsilon naught times r squared. I think I've got some common factors there. And I end up with sigma over epsilon naught just outside the surface of a spherical charge distribution, the electric field is the same as that of an infinite conducting plane. So same as Okay, well, this is like standing in the middle of that flat wheat field. It looks like it goes flat forever, like an infinite plane. And when you get close to it, the electric field is the same as that for an infinite plane. It's not until you get off the surface and start moving away from it that the electric field would actually get smaller. And in that case, this little r would not be the same as that little r up there. Um, this would have to be the radius of the sphere. This is the distance away from the center of the sphere. But if you're just outside the surface, the two are the same. Okay, um, here's one with some thought problems on here. You have a net charge of five microcoulombs applied to one side of a solid metal sphere two centimeters in diameter. After electrostatic equilibrium is reached, what are the volume charge density inside the sphere and B, the surface charge density on the sphere? Well, um, the electric field, oh, any net charge on a conductor resides on its surface. So you've got this metal sphere and you dumped a bunch of charge onto it, five microcoulombs of charge. Those charges will do everything they can to get as far away from each other as they possibly can. And they distribute themselves evenly over the surface of this sphere. And within a very short time, actually what happens is uh, their positive charges, they'll tend to rip electrons off of atoms in the surface of the sphere and those will rip electrons off of adjacent atoms and within a very short time, less than a nanosecond, you'll have an even surface charge dis distribution on this thing. And uh, like charges repel and they will do that. <clears throat> so there will be no volume charge distribution within the sphere, that one's equal to zero because it, all of the surplus charge is going to reside on the surface. And if there was a volume charge distribution that would produce an electric field in the sphere that would move charges around until that volume charge density was canceled out. And so that's what happens. Now, what about the surface charge density of the sphere? Well, um, the surface charge density is going to equal the net charge that you put onto it divided by the surface area. So 4 pi r squared. 
So it will be 5.0 times 10 to the minus sixth coulombs divided by four times pi times 2.0 times 10 to the minus two meters squared. That's the surface area. And so that's just a, a straightforward calculation. Uh, let's see. Assume there are no other charges or conductors nearby. Uh, which of your answers depends on that assumption? Okay. Well, uh, the answer that depends on that assumption would be B. If there are other charges or conductors nearby and they're stationary, and let's make that assumption, um, there will still be an electric field of zero within this conducting sphere. But let's suppose that you brought some other charged object near to it, and maybe here's our sphere, and this is our conducting, our metal sphere. And this is a large, we bring this nearby, charged plastic sphere. Whoops, plastic sphere. And let's just suppose this thing has a uniform charge distribution. It doesn't matter if it's uniform or not. We're going to screw up the uniformity. Anyway, somehow you manage to put a bunch of positive charge onto the surface of this thing. And uh, so you bring it near this thing. Well, you've messed up the symmetry. Okay, you will not have a uniform charge distribution on this sphere in this case. As long as you leave this thing be, once you put it near this, this will be experiencing a um, electrostatic equilibrium. The electric field within it will be zero, so A will still be correct, but you can't have a uniform charge distribution. In fact, this large charged plastic sphere will attract negative charge from this metal sphere. Whoops, negative charge. And you'll get some minus signs on this side of it, but you'll have some plus signs on the other. And you'll actually still have that excess charge of five microcoulombs, but it's not going to be evenly distributed over this thing. So you just can't do any calculation about the surface charge distribution in that case. So these aren't too bad. Um, but do think about them, uh, the concepts on them and things like that. Okay, so here's another situation. A point charge plus Q lies at the center of a spherical conducting shell that contains a net charge of three halves Q. And this is in addition to that plus Q charge, which is not part of the spherical shell anyway. Sketch the field lines both inside and outside the shell using eight field lines to represent a charge of magnitude Q. All right. Well, we're going to take a slice view of this thing. And hey, I've got something allowing me to draw circles. So we'll do this. Whoa, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay, even though this is a spherical shell, I'm going to draw it with a kind of um, thick shell on the thing. And right at the center of this is where our plus Q lies. Now, this is a conducting shell. So this is some kind of metal that we're looking at. And we're in an electrostatic situation here. So within this shaded region, there is no electric field. Sort of shaded. <laughs> OK. 
Okay. So the electric field is zero in the shaded region. Well, if you did Gauss's law and had your Gaussian surface entirely in that shaded region, in order to get zero, remember the integral of E dot n hat dA is equal to the charge enclosed by your surface divided by epsilon naught. Okay. Well, the electric field is zero everywhere within this conductor. So if you're using uh, spherical symmetry, which you will have here, and this is zero, that means the charge enclosed has to be zero. And what that means is uh, you'll get from the metal itself minus Q of charge that will be evenly distributed on the inside of this spherical shell. That way, when you do the, the integral here, that will give you an electric field of zero. However, um, you could also use Gauss's law within the cavity here, the hollow inside of this thing, and the charge enclosed would just be that plus Q. And within here, you'll have an electric field that is spherically symmetric, starts on the charge plus Q and goes radially outward. So we want uh, eight field lines representing this charge of Q. So we'll end up with an electric field within that cavity. And I'm only going to draw it two dimensionally, but it would be spherically symmetric. Missed, but close enough. So that would be the electric field within the cavity, but it's zero outside there. So on that inside level of this thing, you're going to have a charge minus Q evenly distributed okay, around there. Uh, let's see. And then you um, somehow they managed to put a charge three halves Q onto the surface of this thing, but then it redistributed, okay, or something like that. Um, if, let's suppose that you put the charge plus Q in here first and haven't put any other charge on there, well, within a short time, you'd have that minus Q distributed everywhere within here, or at least evenly distributed on the inside, but this thing was still overall neutral, and so that would have left a surface charge density of plus Q. It's like the atoms on the surface lost their electrons and they ended up distributing there. So you've got a charge plus Q on the surface of the outer surface. <laughs> Excuse me. And you add another three halves Q onto that. Well, that's going to make five halves Q distributed over the surface. Okay, and if you take the five halves Q and add it to the minus Q, you still end up with a net charge for the conductor part of three halves Q. All right, um, now we need to sketch the field lines outside the shell. Well, let's see if we had eight field lines to represent a charge of Q, we've got five halves Q, so five halves times eight. I don't want to draw that many. 20 field lines, holy cow. Anyway, that's what we'll have to have outside there. So, um, I'm not sure just how to do that. Um, Okay, there's four, let's see, six, seven, eight. I don't know, gonna have to have a whole bunch. I'm just gonna draw one quadrant's worth. Um, I need to have five of them in one quadrant. So, two, three. And these may not be evenly spaced, but four. 
that's approximately right. Um, all right, and every quadrant would look like that. So uh, anyway, that's the way the, the situation might look. So think about that problem. Um, by the way, these are uploaded so you can uh, print those off and think about them. Let's see, this one is the one that we did yesterday. So, have to worry about that one. Let's see, a solid copper sphere, radius 15 centimeters, carries a charge of 40.0 nanocoulombs. Find the electric field 12, 17, and 75 centimeters from the center of the sphere. Well, part A is easy. Um, yeah, I thought this thing went through. Maybe it doesn't. Okay, well. There's our sphere here, and uh, it has a radius of 15.0 centimeters. And it's got a charge of 40.0 nanocoulombs. That charge will reside on the surface. And so um, once you dump it onto there, it'll just evenly distribute itself on the surface. So that's where the charge is. Within the, con the conductor, the electric field is zero, because if it wasn't, it would redistribute charges. So that's something that happens. So for part A, it says, uh, find the electric field 12 centimeters from the center of the thing. Well, that's still within the conducting part of the sphere, so that's zero for that one. Okay, for B, you are 17 centimeters from the center of a spherical charge distribution. Spherical charge distribution, doesn't matter what it happens to be, if it's spherically symmetric and you're outside of it, the electric field is going to be KQ over R squared. It acts just like the electric field of a point particle. And so, uh, Stick in the 17 centimeters. Um, K, which is one over four pi epsilon naught, but we don't even need that here. Um, 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. Oh, if I'd think of that, it's easy to remember the units of epsilon naught because epsilon naught is on the bottom of a fraction and they're just the reciprocal of these units. Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. So I should know better than that. Okay, 40.0 nanocoulombs, 40.0 times 10 to the minus sixth coulombs. Oops, nano, that's 10 to the minus ninth. And uh, let's see, that's the Q. And then the R squared is uh, 17.0 times 10 to the minus 2 meters squared. And that's all you do for that one. It acts like a point charge. And for part C, um, let's see, um, you just replace this with 75.0 times 10 to the minus 2 meters. So that's all. Now, D says explain how your answers would change if the sphere were hollow. Well, it wouldn't make any difference because the excess charge on the sphere is all going to reside on the outside surface of it. The only way you get charge on the inside surface is if you put something into the inside ahead of time, and we didn't do that. This thing just happens to carry a charge of that much. So um, A would probably still be zero. It's within the sphere. B isn't going to be any different. Um, still a spherically symmetric charge distribution and same with C. So none of them would change. The only way it might is if, uh, let's see, 
I guess it could be like that previous problem, um, wherever it went, uh, where we had the, this one. If you had stuck some charge in there ahead of time and uh, pulled that stunt, but uh, Um, it didn't say that we had done that here, so. Okay, um, let's see. Solid metal sphere of radius A carries a total charge of Q. No other charges nearby. All right, metal conducting. So electric field within is zero. Just outside the sphere, it happens to be K capital Q over A squared radially outward. Is it also given by sigma over epsilon naught? Well, that would be the electric field of a conductor. Um, let's see what we can figure out. Write this thing in terms of epsilon naught. So E is equal to K capital Q over A squared. And K is one over four pi epsilon naught Q over A squared. Well, what's Q gonna look like? I would expect the electric field to be this um, because it is a a uh, metal sphere and not a non-conducting sphere. Q is going to be the surface area of the sphere, which is four pi A squared times sigma. And so what happens if we stick that in for Q? We'll get one over four pi epsilon naught times four pi A squared times sigma over a squared, those go away, the four pi's go away, and we end up with sigma over epsilon naught. So that's what I would have expected anyway. And it's because it is a conducting sphere. This is the electric field of an infinite plane of charge. And if you get close enough to a sphere, it looks like an infinite plane. So that's why I would expect that to be the case. And I think that was it for today. Oh, I ran over as usual. So um, I need some kind of a bell. But uh, those are a bunch of typical uh, Gauss's Law things. The lab that I gave you has some situations that may seem off the wall when you take those on. So um, keep that in mind. Oh, I have to stop the sharing here. Let's see. Yeah, I did post an assignment and pseudo lab. Um, it's one that uh, when we would do it in a two hour lab, um, some of the students would get done with it. The last question is kind of an explanation thing that they would take home to finish typically, but I'd try to make sure that uh, before they left the lab, they'd be ready to do any of the calculations that were necessary on there. I think there's one where you will have to integrate. And uh, but what you're integrating is, uh, the actual integral will break down to something like the integral of z squared dz or something like that. So it's not that hard, but getting it set up and working through the concepts to get it to that point could be kind of challenging. So uh, otherwise, I've got videos to post and so I'll be getting that stuff up there online for yesterday and today. Monday and Tuesday were a waste, unfortunately, but uh, we'll try to move on from there. 
And I'm pretty sure we're at the point where Monday we'll be able to start the chapter on electric potential. So uh, this material is in chapter two and then Monday will be chapter 23. So we should be able to do that. Otherwise, have a good weekend. I'll be watching my messages to see stuff. <laughs>